My name is David Christian, and I teach big history at Macquarie University. Aha. Uh -huh. And I'm originally a Russian historian. A Russian historian. Okay. And uh, oh, I have a book of yours that's right in front of you there. Now, can you sign it for us? Absolutely. I'm All right. To. I don't actually don't have a pen. I've got a pen. You've got a pen. Please sign it for us there. And. Uh, Okay. Charlie with a Y or an I? E Y. E Y. E Y. Pick no. And Molly with an I E. With a Y. With a Y. Okay. Okay. Um, so you do big history. Yes. And um, and part of that is there are several thresholds that you talk about in your big history. Could you tell us a little bit about these thresholds? Yeah, big history began really as with me feeling as a historian that I that 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 historians need to know what the whole of history is. They need to ask the question at some point. What's the whole of history? And when I began asking myself that question, I realized pretty quickly that it only made sense if you went right back to the Big Bang. Uh, and I'd always read read good popular science, so. The original idea was to teach a history of the universe and see how history in the more conventional sense fits into that. But over the years, um, when I first began teaching it, it was hard to find a sort of clear storyline and, and a clear structure. But I think over the years, the idea of increasing complexity emerged as a, as a good, manageable, also I think scientifically interesting storyline. And um, eventually, as really for teaching, I began. I, I I started working with this threshold of eight, eight threshold. The, the structure of eight thresholds of increasing complexity, because it provided a, a nice framework for teaching. I think it's a reasonably good framework for making sense of the science as well, because it really takes you from cosmology to astronomy, to chemistry, to planetary science, to biology, and eventually to human history. So, so this course, that um, this MOOC is about how did we get here, and the hope is that by looking at how we got here, we can figure out whether we're alone or not. Yeah. Now, in other words, if you try to assign probabilities to the events that led to us. Now, can you do anything like that? I, look, I've tried, but of course, I'm, I'm a Russian historian, so when I do that, I read, I read the scientists. Um, mm -hmm. And so I've looked at the famous Drake equation and, and tried to sort of work out my own, my own version of it. Um, but since you're a Russian historian, you could tell us about the probability of Russian then. What's the probability of Russian? If we have, live in an infinite universe, how many other Earth-like planets did we have to, would we have to get in order to have a Russia? I would think it's, it's got to be close to infinite, doesn't it? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, this is a hard game we're trying to play here. But, but my understanding is that, that over the last 30 or 40 years, I mean, as I've been interested in, in trying to make sense of this, so I read good popular science. And when I began doing this, astrobiology was a joke scientifically. It was what science, science fiction writers did. And I've watched it become a science. And I think one of the things is that now that Drake equation, we can actually fill in quite a few more of, more of the blanks on the Drake equation, above all exoplanets. Now, I've seen an estimate, I don't know how respectable it is, that even in our Milky Way, there may be 17 billion vaguely Earth-like planets. Um, well, how many would you need to have in order to have a human being or a uh, intelligent species or life or Russia? I, these are things. <laughs> can you make any estimate? Russia is extraordinarily specific. But back how about Putin? Putin is even more specific. Even right? more specific. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you'd, you'd won a lot of universes before you had two Putins, I think. Um, but, but bacteria, surely. If there's life anywhere in the universe, bacteria have to be the easier shot. And I think the, I mean, the simplest reason for a, for a non-scientist to say that is, is that you look at the dates. So the Earth appears 4.567 billion years ago as part of the solar system. Uh, life is probably there by 3.8 billion years ago. Some people are saying earlier than 4 billion years. Um, but then you have to wait until 500 million years ago before you start getting a lot of multicellular life. So, so bacterial life may be quite simple, multicellular life looks as if it's a lot more difficult.
Well, there's also the problem of the RNA world. The RNA world preceded bacterial life, and yeah. therefore maybe it is more likely. Yes, yes. So maybe a pre-bacterial world is even more likely. But my understanding, and again, this is from reading good popular science, my understanding is that the odds on this being a universe that's crawling with life have increased very significantly. And that's what, maybe one of the reasons why astrobiology has, is, has become so much more serious. I mean, we're finding, we're finding living organisms on this planet in really weird environments. Uh, what, but I'm most interested in the concept of you as a historian are dealing now with science and you, you, you set up these thresholds with, uh, these are the ingredients, these are the Goldilocks conditions, and then these is the threshold. Now, could you imagine doing that in, in history? For example, here's Hitler, is the, the threshold, and then you say, okay, here are the, the ingredients that led to Hitler, here are the Goldilocks conditions. Yep. Now, does that make any sense? Look, I think, yeah, I mean, it's a great question. Um, the, the idea of thresholds began as a teaching idea, not, not as a kind of research idea, as a, as a way of helping students get a sense of what we mean when we're talking about increasing complexity. And again, not at a very technical level, but so as a way of grasping the idea of emergence above all. The idea that when we talk about something more complex, we're talking about something that seems to have new qualities, qualities that never existed before. So we see something new in the universe. I, because you're crossing from the natural sciences into the humanities, one of the problems I realized very early on, as a, both a teaching problem and a kind of writing problem, is translation. How do I translate from the language of a cosmologist or a geologist into the language of, of, of a historian? So I would say you're absolutely right that the idea of a threshold is not a piece of a historian's jargon. I don't think it's a piece of many scientists' jargon, although they may have similar, they may talk about phase changes or something like that. But it's, it's, a, it's a piece of jargon that seems to work at a teaching level at least, across multiple disciplines. I suspect maybe it works at a slightly above the teaching level too. But, but, it, but in many ways it sounds like something that Stephen Jay Gould fought against for much of his career, the great chain of being. Yep. How, what do you, how do you answer that? I think, look, I adore Stephen Jay Gould. I've read a huge amount of him, but eventually I'd read enough of Stephen Jay Gould to start thinking, I don't think I agree with you on a lot of things. And it was above all the Burgess Shale book that persuaded me, me of that. Like a lot of uh, academics, like a lot of historians, for example, he's determined to avoid the idea of directionality in history. And I know exactly why, because for historians, the idea of directionality is tainted. Yes. They see Spencer, and very soon they see uh, they see civilizations beating up on former colonies. So the whole idea of progress is deeply tainted for them. Now, it seems to me that, uh, you know, I, I share those ethical concerns, but, but you need to actually prize away the idea of a value judgment from the idea of directionality. Now, to deny, because you don't like the directionality, it seems to me it's kind of crazy to deny that there are directions in history. In other words, things at one time in the past were very different from things at other times in the past. So if I look at human history over 200,000 years, which very few historians do, um, I, can do, I can prepare a graph of human population growth, and it's a sort of exponential curve at that, that scale. That, if someone tells me there's not a direction in that curve, well, I don't know what universe they're living in. Um, a direction of curve of increasing population. Increasing population, in well, that case. So the, it, and you, the directionality you, but, means there's something to be explained. Right, but can't you look at the population of any species? It, it starts out low and then goes up and then it probably falls and then you go extinct. Yeah, I sure, mean, sure. So you what, could, what's you the directionality could, there? You, 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 you could, for the time of, of the rise, there's a clear directionality. That directionality is also important because it raises problems about or questions about what's going on. The weird thing about humans is with most species, yes indeed, you get a species appearing, it evolves, it will, its populations will grow to fill a niche, and then what you find is it fluctuates around that niche, the niche itself fluctuates a bit, the stochastic process is going on, and then eventually it goes extinct. You look at the human population curve, and it's really weird. 
by comparison with those of animals. Because what you see in the human population curve is this exponential curve. Now, it may eventually kick in, but it's, this one has waited until it dominates a planet before you get the downtick. So if you refuse to see directionality in that, you're denying yourself the possibility of asking a whole series of really interesting questions about what makes us weird, including questions about where we are right now. Because I, I think you can argue that we live in a really weird moment right now. The first time in four billion years that a single species is mobilizing resources and flows of energy on the same scale as planetary systems, as the ocean system, as the climate system, as the carbon system. That is really weird. And again, if you refuse to see directionality, you're going to somehow pretend that that didn't happen. And how can you think about the Anthropocene? How can you think about where we are? Well, what about the idea, you mentioned physics, and in cosmology, one of the things that's fundamental is the second law of thermodynamics. Yeah. And so when you put on your equation ingredients, Goldilocks conditions, and then a complexity threshold, at the same time you have a complexity threshold, you have an organization that increases the entropy of the universe more than it was before. Yes. So there's this, you know, we're running towards a heat death. So instead of putting increased complexity on the right hand side, you could also say closer to the heat death. So it's a little bit of a, a different connotation yes. and it, it's yes. a different type of arrow. Now that's the arrow that most physicists are much more comfortable with than increasing complexity. So increasing complexity means, oh, it's kind of good thing, interesting, we're, at, we're it. Now, on the other hand, a heat death means, hey, just waste heat, nothing, no structure. And yet that's what the second law tells us. The, if there is a directionality yeah. in physics, that's the directionality. So how do you uh, I don't know, justify those two, almost, e they're pointing in opposite directions almost. Well, look, that, that gives the narrative its tension, surely. I mean, if there was just increasing entropy, you know, if the universe began with high entropy and over 14 billion, well, over 10 to the 104 billion years, I think was a figure I read recently, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, entropy just kept on increasing. What a boring story that would be. So a story in which something in the universe temporarily kicks back against this long-term trend, that's a much more interesting story. So I would defend, by, by the way, I would not accept, a, you know, I, I do not defend a uh, and I would not argue for a sort of formulaic use of that, that equation as you described. It's a very simple teaching way to help people ask questions about these thresholds. I, I, I'm acutely aware there's lots of other nuances that are missed by this idea of Goldilocks conditions, increasing energy flows and, and complexity. But the story of increasing complexity, given that my audience consists of human beings, not cockroaches and not, you know, not protons, um, it's really interesting for us because you can argue that the, the, the world we live in today is damn close to the most complex thing that we know about. Now, I'm sure there are lots of to and toing and froing you could have about that, but, it, but it's not an implausible argument. So this, this story about increasing complexity despite entropy, I think is an incredibly interesting one for humans. It's also very relevant to contemporary politics, because um, it's a reminder that, that the more complex things, I think there may be a general rule that the more complex things are built with greater difficulty, that the, the Goldilocks conditions are much more stringent, so in, and they don't live as long. So in some sense, they're more fragile. And if we want to make sense of the Anthropocene, of today's world, if we want to not mess it up, we really have to understand this tension between entropy and complexity. Mm -hmm. oh, well, you mentioned the word Goldilocks. So, so Goldilocks seems to imply that the universe could have been otherwise than it is, and that the narrow range of conditions or ingredients, uh, well, there's a narrow range that led to us, or led to what we have today.
On the other hand, if you say that, uh, no, the conditions are that way and they couldn't have been different, then the whole idea of a, a Goldilocks zone doesn't make any difference. For example, in a habitable zone around a star, a circumstellar habitable zone, you have what's called a Goldilocks zone of temperature. You get too close to the star, it's too hot. You get too far, it's too cold. So we say, oh, there's a Goldilocks habitable zone. But there, you really have instantiation of a hot region and a cold region. But if you say, um, if you say something like there's a Goldilocks condition for the fresh creation of stars, for example, that's not a, a term that astronomers would be comfortable no, with. No, no, but you use that, so can you talk to that issue? Look, I, I mean, I use this language partly because I'm trying to get a complicated, well, first, I'm trying to get on top of a complicated story, and I'm not an astronomer, so I, 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 I can get so far with the story. But secondly, I'm then trying to make it available in as respectable a form I can, and sometimes okay. to use astronomer's jargon is not helpful. Okay, so let's why, apply it to know. Homo sapiens then. Is there a legitimate, do anthropologists use for a Goldilocks zone for the uh, evolution of humanity, or let's say agriculture? Is there a uh, Goldilocks zone? Is there? Actually, I've, I have seen, I mean, Paul Davis wrote a book. Yes, I know that. Talking, know. using this term. <laughs> so it has been used, yeah, maybe, maybe not in the context of a multiverse. Time. But look, my, my justification for using it would be much simpler, is that it, 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 it's, it's a, a way of intuitively getting something, an idea across quickly to students who are, for the most part, not scientists. And the idea is, 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 is really this, that, that complexity in the universe is incredibly rare, incredibly rare. And, and I think most students don't understand that. They don't understand how unique is this environment. So this environment is just right on so many scales. Um, temperature is just right. The, the, you know, the, the, the fact that water can exist in different, different stages. Um, so it's just right for the emergence of life. So the idea of Goldilocks conditions is one that I use most of the time you know, within the universe, that there are spaces in the universe where, for reasons we may not fully understand, you get just the right conditions for increasing complexity. But, it, but isn't it the case that no matter what your conditions are, those conditions will produce something, and then you could say, oh, those conditions were just right to produce the thing it did produce. Yeah, you could say, you could say, I mean, I could if I wanted to <laughs> talk about the Goldilocks conditions for the vacuum, I suppose. But I just don't think it would be terribly helpful. Given, you know, in a story about where we, we, we've, we choose to focus on increasing complexity because we're complex. So that's why it's our story. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I, very early on, I thought, let's see if we could think through this story objectively. In other words, let's forget about the fact that, that I'm a human being and most of my students are human beings, uh -huh. I think. Yeah. Um, and, and then I thought, what would my story look like? And I realized very quickly, it's going to be stunningly boring because it's it? going to be, I'm going to be talking for 99.9% .9 of the time about the vacuum. Yeah. And I'm going to be re repeating myself. It's a boring story. So, uh, so you're saying so that, that Eric Chason and his work on cosmic evolution, he's, he's made a little bit of a critique of big history compared to what he's been doing with cosmic evolution for a, a little while now. And uh, the idea is that, oh, big history is too concentrated on humanity, puts humanity front and center, and that's what the students, I guess you appeal to a kind of vanity. So, hey, I'm the most important thing here, and let's explain how I got here. Here, while a physicist would feel really bad about doing that, and they'd say, well, let's, let's talk about the most specific thing closest to what I am is life, and let's not get any more specific. Let's not talk about Putin, yeah. or let's not talk about David Christian, or let's Russians. Let's talk about something as generic as I, as I can, and then I'd call it objective. Fine. Uh, so my response to that is, uh -huh. If that rocks your boat, great. <laughs> but I am a historian, right, right. and I think a lot of people who read books are interested in how this particular society got to be the way it is. Mm -hmm. So I understand Eric's, Eric is an astronomer and he's, he's, a, he's a physicist. His, the focus of his interests are slightly different from mine. So I mean, I'd simply defend these choices on the grounds that, that you, you, know, you, you, you choose questions that are interesting. And they are interesting for me as a historian. In fact, I would, I would argue that Scientists, by and large, have been much more open than people in the human scholars in the humanities to the idea of telling a sort of universal, a modern universal story. The problem is when they tell it, and I think this was true even of, of, of Carl, Carl Sagan, for example, is that they, as you say, they, they lose interest once they get to humans. But for a lot of humans, it really is interesting to know, you know, how the Industrial Revolution happened, how in the last 200 years uh, we've developed 
a world which you, you move from sort of 900 million to 7 billion. Um, the last 5 billion appeared in my own life. How the hell does that happen? And what are the dangers around it? So all of those questions are very specific questions. And you can only, only ask them if you actually focus on the details of the trajectory of change over human history. There's another question. You, you, you talked about whether this was a sort of species arrogance. And I, I, I'm Speciesism. fascinated, <laughs> well, yeah, fascinated by that question. And, 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 and I think, um, of course it may be. I mean, my list of thresholds, the last three, involve humans. And if you look at the timeline, that's ridiculous because mm -hmm. we just end up buried in the, in the last line of the timeline. But I, th I, I often wonder whether it's just a species arrogance or whether it's just that I'm talking to humans. So I say, look, we're interested in humans, so let's just yeah, forget about the title. We've, we've evolved to be interested it's, in ourselves. What's exactly. wrong with that? <laughs> so that, that's a possible answer. Yeah. But I'd love to think there may be a slightly deeper answer. And that, I think, is that the appearance of our species on this planet really does objectively count as a threshold moment. And I'm thinking of the Anthropocene. The first species in four billion years, and I think it's linguistic, that has the capacity to exchange ideas, as we're doing, with such precision, in such bandwidth, that ideas accumulate across generations. We know that does not happen for any other species. We know that because if it did, we'd see evidence of it, if it happened for chimps. Well, how about the Susan Blackmore's idea that the memes are taking over? It's not our evolution, but the evolution of the memes that we should be concentrating on, and that that would be the threshold that memes would be interested in, but not us, because we would then be just a purveyor, a conveyor of the ideas. If uh, we if we just if we are sheep to memes, if we're just the domesticates of memes, a still from our point of view, it's quite interesting. I mean, if sheep could figure out why the hell humans control their lives and execute them at will for food, that would be interesting for sheep, but they can't do it. So that would be my first defense. I mean, my second would be, uh, once again, though I'm not a scientist, I've read enough that there comes a point where I, I find some arguments plausible and some arguments not. Uh, and I'm afraid, much as I like the work of Richard Dawkins, the idea of memes doesn't quite do it for me. I don't, I don't think it works until no, I don't think it works because I, I... Why doesn't it work? I mean, memes are definitely evolving and they're definitely using us, our brains, as a kind well, of environment know, in which no, to no, live. If you say using, you uh -huh. know, I think you're smuggling in something. I am. I a, sense of, a sense of... Uh, 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 I, I'm not Volition, quite sure what it is. agency. A sense of agency. That humanitarian, that humanities um, people usually say it's only for humans, but uh, I guess I'd, I'm not one of those people. Yeah, I'm not, look, it's a cute idea. And I, I mean, it, as a historian, I'm surrounded by ideas that are cute, uh -huh. but not rigorous. And that's, I'm afraid, what I think about, I, I also like Susan Blackmore. I have read, read yeah. her stuff, and I yeah. like it very much. Okay. That idea, uh, I, now maybe it's my, my fault, but I, so, I, I... But if you did like it more, and was more than just cute, you would put it as a threshold? Okay. Well, then, then, there would be a whole series of interesting questions. And the main one would be, why did memes not get a grip on a species before 200,000 years ago. What is it about our species that allows memes to get a type of grip on our species that they don't have on chimps, they don't have on any other species? Mm -hmm. So that would be just the meme-centered version of the question that fascinates me. And, and the question that fascinates, the way I'm phrasing it is of course, you know, it's like, it's, it's an old, old philosopher's chestnut. What makes humans different? But, but a lot of people like Ray Kurzweil and others think that very soon they're gonna be computers, you know, writing, com com computing themselves, writing programs, and then we'll reach some singularity and then humans will yes. become obsolete and then the memes will just evolve much faster than we are able to as biological creatures and then, boom, we're just left in the dust behind something that evolves yeah. much faster. Yeah. In the, men, many of the same arguments that people said, once you have sexual selection, you, have, you can evolve much quicker than the, these poor, bacterial so you're not afraid of this idea or what do you think of this idea in the future in a hundred or a thousand or a million years that there will be or 50 or 50 that's right. i've just been Is reading it? nick bostrom's uh -huh. super intelligence yeah. yes, 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 yes. Uh -huh. which i found absolutely terrifying mm -hmm. and um but not terrifying enough to put it as a threshold Oh, well, well, it's in the future. I mean, I mean, oh. it, 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 as a possibility, uh, yes. I so, I mean, I, 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 I can't <laughs> discount it more than anyone else. Um, uh, but even then, 
it, it, that would simply mean that our perspective on human history is rather limited and the, a Kurzweil perspective would would once again be, be a perspective on which you know, life evolves according to certain rules for four billion years, then there's a sort of explosion of some kind. And as a historian, I see the human part of that explosion. If you're Ray Kurzweil, I suppose you might, might want to imagine yourself in, in 10,000 years' time seeing the human part as simply the, 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 the starting point for something else uh, in which the, the later carriers are, are, are machines, but still will want to ask about what was it about humans? that made them the raw material or the, or the fuse, whatever the metaphor is, for, for this as, uh, astonishing change. I mean, back to the Drake equation. Um, it, one of the things that fascinates me, uh, and I, I gave a talk which is just a sort of thought experiment, but um, it, it's really all about the possibility that, that, that yes, indeed, we're, we're hitting a wall of some kind. And Fermi's question, you know, where are they? Why, why haven't we seen them? If, 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 let's be precise, if creatures, complex creatures capable of what I call collective learning, this is this accumulation of information, if they exist elsewhere in the universe, the vast majority of them must have been around for a long, long time. They ought to be way, way, way ahead of us. And you'd think we'd, seen, we'd see some trace of them. So one possibility, at least, is that there's a, there's a wall, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a blockage at some point. And the terrifying thought that's very relevant for today and for politics today and for education today is we may be very close to it. Now, it could be a Kurzweilian wall in which, which we morph into something else. But it could be a sort of echospheric one. There's a wonderful um, science fiction novel called A Canticle for Leibovitz, mm -hmm. uh, straight after mm -hmm. World War II. Mm. And it's a sort of description of the wall. It's in a post-nuclear world, the flame deluge is the phrase they use. And you're in a sort of dark ages world in which they're preserving manuscripts from the past, from the pre, before the deluge. And slowly in the novel, you move forward across the centuries and they relearn modern science. And eventually they build nuclear weapons again and they use them again. So it's the most terrifying image of this, this wall. Well, let's, um, go, let's go back to this question of uh, um, how did we get here and are we alone? And for example, let's suppose that there's World War III and we kill ourselves. Now there's a movie called The Planet of the Apes in which the apes then yeah. evolve to inhabit this intelligence niche. But let's th do a little bit better than Hollywood here. So let's uh, have World War III and then let's imagine what, is there such a thing as an intelligence niche? You use the metaphor of, hey, more advanced than us, so you're, obviously you're assuming that there's some type of trajectory of once a... Okay, I, I, I hate the word advanced, and if I use it, I'm sorry, it. then, then I, should, I take it back. Let's, you need to be more precise. Um, a species, the, the defining f feature of us, I think, is this capacity to accumulate information across generations. That gives you power, because information gives you control over the resources so of that, your environment. Isn't that what genes do? But apparently in a limited way, and that takes us back. The rules of natural selection give us this pattern we've talked about earlier, of a species that rises to a certain, fills its niche, and then its population fluctuation, then it, then it goes extinct. Whereas now we have a niche, well, we have a species that because it can accumulate information and because information is power, you can watch it in Paleolithic world. Mm -hmm. You watch humans spreading around the earth. Mm -hmm. They're learning how to live in Ice Age Siberia. So They're you're talking about Lamarckian evolution. So well, it, is, it is Lamarckian. Suddenly new rules of evolution because, because culture is carrying a lot of the burden that genes used to carry in the past. But isn't horizontal gene transfer Lamarckian evolution? Horizontal gene in, in bacteria. Yeah, bacteria talk to each other with genes. They just exchange genes. Yes, and, and so you could surely argue that that's... bacteria collectively have had something like the Anthropocene. But, it's, but I think it's an important distinction from a biological point of view that we're talking about a single species here. We're not talking about a whole collection of species. We're not talking about photosynthetic al algae, mm -hmm. you know, who mm -hmm. certainly transformed the climate system mm -hmm. by you know, pumping oxygen into it. We're talking about a single species, that's brand new. So there has to be a new mechanism at work. But even yeah. the idea of the species is new. I mean, in bacteria, it's very hard to talk about species. So they sure. all, sure. you have to have sexual selection in order to have a species. So yeah. of course, species yeah. are new. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So in the bacterial world, yeah, no, I, I agree. But, but nevertheless, 
the idea of a multi-celled organism in which the idea of a species does make sense, behaving in the way that uh, you know whole groups of bacteria have behaved in the past, um, and also apparently maybe more powerfully because those photosynthetic bacteria were still subject you know subject to changing conditions that, that they, they couldn't push at the limits right, the way we humans can but what you're describing is humans but yep. what what i want to know is let's suppose that humans were not here we kill yes. ourselves yes. or we never evolved and the question is okay. is there such a thing as a evolutionary selection pressure towards what we think the human niche is in other words if we go extinct give me a guess how long would it take before this what you call collective learning would evolve again yes. so, so that, we can, that we can define as the niche i think collective learning okay if you define um, it that way how and, long would it take and look again all, all i can say is you know i i ask these questions myself and i sort of read the uh -huh. good good popular literature i'm fascinated you talked about stephen jay gould earlier um, Simon Conway Morris was his great opponent. And Simon Conway Morris, I believe, is not in a small minority amongst biologists who argue that, the, um, that evolutionary pathways may actually be more constrained than we're inclined mm -hmm. to think. Now, if that's true, mm -hmm. then that is very interesting for thinking about life elsewhere. Well, then you can use something like advancement and then you have an arrow in which to go. It's called the convergence I, I, towards yeah, I, intelligence. Exactly. But I, Stephen Jay Gould would argue, no, there is no such thing. And so it's a big controversy in biology. Well, if you take the whole of history of life. So back to the question of directionality. I prefer the word directionality to advance because advance yeah. smuggles yeah. in value judgments. Mm -hmm. So can we define a trajectory, a direction in, in in evolutionary history. Uh, I think you surely can, and I think most biologists would say over four billion years, it's quite easy to see one. On shorter scales, it may be harder. But, but um, I mean, is it towards collective Sorry? learning? Is it towards collective learning? If you only have one example of what you're saying, oh, it's only humans can do this, well, then you only have one example that's species-specific and species don't come back. Not quite, because what we have is a lot of species in which... So if we think of collective learning as a whole series of capacities that were released by a switch, it's the switch is the only one-off thing. We can identify lots of species who have lots of the skills that we humans have, but it's as if nothing quite brought them together. So, but if it's a switch, might it be as, as quirky as a Putin? Or is it uh, well, generic no, and no. we should expect it elsewhere? No, no, no. but surely if, 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 if I'm right that, and I think I'm saying something that a lot of a lot, of, um, a lot of people who ask this question about what makes humans different would agree on. This information accumulation is crucial. Therefore, language is probably crucial. There, and that, to me, suggests that the switch probably had something to do with a slight re reorganization of the brain. So the, the switch is still in the world of natural selection. The consequences take us into this world of cultural, but, cultural but change. But the question is how common is it, well, how probable is the switch on another planet? You're, you're talking about something that's somehow yeah. a threshold. And the question is, sh is this a threshold that we should expect to be common elsewhere, or is it something as unique as the English language we're speaking I, right now? I must now? admit, I'm, I'm tempted to think it, it, it is a threshold, but it's a difficult one. In other words, uh, if, if we were talking earlier about, about what well, you were talking about, the RNA world, maybe quite easy if you have roughly rough Goldilocks conditions, to use my, my terminology, then then a bacterial world. Then eukaryotes, I've just been reading a book by Nick Lane in London, arguing that, and he argues that eukaryotes really, that really is a one-off, that symbiosis that mm -hmm. generates eukaryotes. But, but let's say that's just more difficult. Multicellularity is clearly more difficult. Once we get multicellularity, we get a lot of lineages in which brains develop and more sophisticated um, forms of communication. Now that all suggests to me that something like collective learning is, is not that weird. It was sort of within the possibilities well, of many, many different species. Well, that's because brains, however, are monophyletic, and that is that it used to be only one species. And if you have a trait that's only specific to a species, you're talking about something that's very, very specific, and very few biologists would say that a species would evolve again.
No, no, but I mean, br br complex neurological systems have evolved in many lineages, lineages, haven't they? Well, I'm not sure about that. I think heads octopi, only evolved once. Octopi do well, pretty yeah, well. Well, we have a common ancestor with octopi that had a head. Yeah. So, so, so you could, maybe you can run an argument that that was a really weird a head. genetic change, as Nick Lane does about eukaryotes. Right, but, but the question I'm is, we want, to we want to evaluate these probabilities on other yeah. planets, and yeah. how common is this eukaryote, or how common is the yeah. formation of a head, or how common is what we call the intelligence dish. And it's not obvious to me that they are probable enough that we should expect them even in an infinite universe. On the other people, other hand, some people say, oh yes, they're so good, our adaptations are so good, we should expect them everywhere. So what we're trying to do as scientists is evaluate these probabilities yeah. from anywhere from zero to yeah. it's one, right? Yeah. And so what we need help with is to evaluate those probabilities. So how do you do that? I, I, I'm afraid <laughs> <laughs> Here I'm going to turn into a complete coward. I don't think I'm the person to answer that question. You know, and I, my attempts to answer it involve you know reading good good popular science. Um, if you if you think of life, okay. So this is a, a, a way of thinking of life as the first complex, the first type of complex entity we know. That okay. Here I'm really going out on a limb. That has to use what I call local information. I, I think this, it's helpful to distinguish between universal information and local information. Universal information is, is the, the laws of physics. They're embedded in, in everything. And I think you can explain some forms of complexity just by talking about those, the creation of, of stars, maybe up to the level of, of the creation of simple molecules. But there comes a point where you're dealing with, with complex entities that appear and exist only in very specific environments. To survive in those environments, they have to be able to, as it were, read local information, not general information. Mm -hmm. So they have to be equipped with capacities for reading information in order to control the energy flows that they're going to survive from. Now, if something exists that can do that at the most basic level, and if that thing has the capacity to evolve by natural selection, then at a very general level, it's surely a reasonable guess that given enough time, this entity is going to explore more and more possibilities for controlling energy in the environment. And if information is as crucial as I'm suggesting it is, that ought to suggest there might be a kind of evolutionary pressure towards, in some lineages, not in all, towards structures that give you more and more control over information. Now, if that's right, okay. then well, it well, suggests that, that it is plausible to suspect that complex neurological systems and eventually brains should emerge. Well, our brains emerged, I think, or tripled in size in about three million years or yes. so. Yeah. And uh, we did it on, in Africa, and there were about six other continents that had hundreds, if not thousands and thousands of encephalated mammals, for example, that if there were such a thing as an intelligence niche, they would have plenty of intervals of three million years to increase their brain size the way we did, if three million years is some type of standard. And yet we don't find them. So, for example, South America was independent for about 60, 70, 80 million years after it separated from Africa. Yeah. Lots of species there, lots of monkeys. And the question is, if there is such a tendency to evolve towards this intelligence niche of collective learning, then 70 million years is plenty of time to do it. And yet it didn't. Nothing that we would identify as a collective learner evolved there. The same thing for New Zealand, the same thing for yeah. Australia, the same thing for Madagascar, same thing with India. So the idea of there being an intelligence niche towards which there's selection pressure doesn't seem to be supported by that evidence over the last hundred million well, years. Unless, unless you say that, that, that this is a long, slow process and um, some lineage has to be first. And you add one more thing, which is that given the explosive consequences of such a lineage emerging, you don't expect a second one unless the first is wiped out. Well, and then you may get a second one. Because I mean, there has we, to be we've blocked off the possibility. I mean, well, that's only 50,000 years ago did we block sure. it off when we started spreading around the world. But sure, before well, we slaughtered most of the large yeah, mammals but that's in only Australia. 10, in that's only 10,000 years. I'm talking, yeah. about, I'm talking about 50 million years. Um, but you said that somebody has to be first.
Well, does there have to be a first, I don't know, elephant? No, well, all, I, all I mean is that, all I mean by that is that, that, that um, the fact that, that you don't get pe creatures capable of collective learning before us may simply mean that we were the first. You know, that's simply a matter of how fast this process works. If it works fairly slowly... But aren't you assuming what you're trying to sh argue about? And uh, you're assuming that it will come. So, uh, no, no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm yeah. say, say, so if, then somebody doesn't have to be first then. If you're not assuming that, then somebody... If you assume that, if you assume there's a gentle pressure towards increasing intelligence and that that pressure eventually is going to push some lineage across this immensely significant but maybe very small threshold in the collective learning, then yeah, someone has to be first. I mean, same with eukaryotes. You know, someone had to be the first eukaryote. Did somebody have to be the first English speaker? Well, I, I'm not quite, I mean, in a sense, yes. I, okay. But, but, <laughs> All right. This, this, there's a debate about, I don't know, 20 years ago between uh, Sagan and who is the fellow who, who the Harvard biologist, uh, I've forgotten his name, but they had a debate in the pages of an astro a very obscure astronomy journal. And they talked, and Sagan kept on saying the word functionally equivalent human beings. There are more than one way to evolve intelligence. And uh, this biologist said, uh, no, this is a species specific trait and therefore there's not one way. In other words, he, the biologist was saying that our closest relatives, functionally, genetically, any way you want to talk about it, are here on Earth. And Sagan was assuming, no, our functionally closer relatives are on another planet. We call these the intelligent species. So talk to us about that debate. I, I, don't, I don't know that debate. I don't know my, my way around it. Um, certainly the idea of, I guess, if there is this sort of tendency uh, towards increasing control over information, and if that tendency su suggests that eventually some species is going to cross the threshold of collective learning, then um, I guess I'd be with Sagan. Because I, I think... I think the idea of collective learning, which is, I mean, it's a, it's a term I call, it's, a, it's an idea that, I, it's one of the few ideas that I teach that I, 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 I can claim some ownership of. Um, I think it's a very useful way of discriminating between intelligence, which chimps have, and cats have, and dolphins have, I mean, a lot, and crows have, and the sort of intelligence that generates the explosive impact of our species, because ours is in, it, collective, it's, it's, it's not individual. Um, if that's true, then, then the biological differences between us and chimps may be very small by, by many standards, but the functional differences are absolutely colossal. And on those grounds, I guess I'd, I'd be with Sagan. And, and there's, a, there's a nice way, by the way, there's a nice way, this is a teaching trick, but uh -huh. of getting a sense of collective learning. I, 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 I say to students, um, so close your eyes and look inside your head and do a quick census of everything that's there. And they, they panic. And I say, hey, it'll take you five seconds. Don't worry about it. Do a quick sentence. And, and, and then, then you ask yourself a question. If I had never talked with another human being in my entire life, how much of that stuff would be there? And once you start thinking like that, you start seeing the, in, the illusion of individuality. It's the chimps that are the individualists. We humans live in this sort of sea of information. Mm -hmm. and I, that, 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 you know, so we are collective in a way that, that other, and that is, that I think is new on planetary scales. Well, I think E.O. Wilson would, would argue that ants did that before we did, and that they, they are social insects, so they're social creatures. Yeah, but, but accumulating information on the time scales of cultural change, this is, yes, they're collective, but the mechanism of their collective behavior, I think, I think you can reasonably say it's fundamentally genetic. It's not cultural. And, and that affects the speed of change because it means that, that, that you know, genetic change can be quite fast, but that sets a limit to the, the, the speed of the, of, of, of the social, of the, of the change of, of ants. So I, 
I think there's something radically different about us because the mechanism is, is, is different. It's cultural, not right, genetic. But, but Nick Bostrom, I think Ray Kurzweil would say, yes, you're right, and you're so right that computers are now doing what, you, what you're just describing. That is, they're yeah. much faster, they're exchanging information, they're doing collective learning, and then boom, they're gone, and mm -hmm. we're going to be sitting here in our biological cells with our little brain in our case and say, what do you mean by that? I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Yeah. So be part of a, like a cell in a multicellular collective brain or something. What do you think of that idea? I, 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 it terrifies the hell terrifies. out of me, but, but, but it's in the logic, Why would it of, what, it's in the logic of what I'm saying. Why does it terrify you? Oh, because I, <laughs> I'm made of squishy stuff, you know. <laughs> I'm a human being. And, and, um, and you want to be more important than a part of a giant no, it's brain. Not, it's not that I want to be important. I mean, you know, for good genetic reasons. If I, if I, if I um, you know, I, I'm, I'm built to care for those very close to me and with slightly more difficulty for, you know, for those I recognize as, as, as human. I mean, that's built into me genetically. And, I mean, that's natural selection. Uh -huh. Right. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, let's see. Um, I think, I th how about the question, are we alone? Tell us, that, what do you have any insights <laughs> into that? Are we alone? Look, I don't really think I have any deep insights. So again, it's, any insights are, are the results of, uh, of, of reading a lot of popular science. Maybe one, which is that the question itself is really worth asking because it helps us think, I think, clearly about our trajectory here. So this whole question about the possibility of, a, of, of Collective learning being an explosive mechanism that that no oh, I'm mixing my metaphors here but an explosive metaphor that, that explosive mechanism that um, can't go on can't go on forever you know there's there's a limit to it and that that may be why if species like us evolve then it may be that none of them get beyond this stage of being a planet changing species they reach that stage. And then they, they mess things up. Um, so, so, I mean, that, I, I guess the, the only other thing is it's very banal and very obvious to anyone who reads any of this stuff, I think, is, is simply that, that, that the likelihood that there are other creatures like this, I think, looks much greater now than it did 30 or 40 years ago because we know that living organisms on this biosphere can live in such extreme environments. So that widens the... The, the Goldilocks conditions for life, and and secondly because of the discovery of, of exoplanets and and the, the 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 fact that so many of them are probably quite Earth-like. When I asked the question, "Are we alone?" Who what did in your brain? What did you mean by "we"? Okay, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I'm 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 I, for me the interesting question is other creatures capable of collective learning. Mm -hmm. so, um, so not life on Earth, but rather collective but, but, human beings. But that, presupposes, that presupposes life. I mean, I think, I think if, it, it's hard to avoid the idea that if life is very common, um, then which, which, given the speed with which it appeared, seemed to have appeared on our planet, that seems to be more and more likely. And then you can see these other stages uh, of, of, of this exploration of information or this exploration of a biosphere that appeared at, at greater time intervals which suggests they're much more difficult. But, so, but, but, but nevertheless that suggests that, that life, there is a sort of directionality to long-term evolution. So wherever you get bio-friendly planets that are moderately stable for several billion years um, it may be reasonable, and I'm hedging all my bets, it may be reasonable to imagine um, that eventually they will generate a species capable of collective learning. I mean, you've talked about us wiping ourselves out. Yeah. I mean, I think one shouldn't rule out the possibility that wait another hundred years and, and you know, the cockroaches are doing it. <laughs> so, okay, let's suppose we do wipe ourselves out. Uh, what will then happen? Do you think there'll be, you, you suggest that there is a selection pressure towards collective learning. What other species around us today would be the recipients of this selection pressure so that they too would then uh, pass 
have the switch to do collective learning? Would it be, for example, I don't know, the trees out there, or would we be mushrooms, or would we be chimps, or would there be octopi, or cockroaches, or what would you suggest uh, would it's, it's evolve very, in this direction towards being a human being or having collective learning? It's, it, octopi might be a good octopi. candidate. But it depends, uh, because octopi, there's a sporting chance of them surviving the Holocaust. Well, they've been around for, I think, you know, I, I would guess in the same form, maybe 100 million years, maybe 200 million years. Yeah. And so that's a long time to be there uninterrupted, presumably unsuppressed by the human intelligence niche. And so why didn't they do it already? Well, because it's a slow process. I mean, that seems to be a perfectly reasonable answer. You know, we, if, if it, it, it's taken, it's taken us, it's taken us a hell of a long time. It's very sudden when it happens. Um, when you, we know of no other species in in four billion years that's crossed this threshold. We seem to be the first. Um, so it's a long, slow process. And presumably, if there are, it's it's stochastic as well. Because if we're talking about um, you know, genetic, maybe quite small genetic modifications in the wiring of the brain that just just improve the power of language, then then there's no reason why we shouldn't have hung around for another few more million years, tens of million years before we got collective learning. I, um, okay. <laughs> All right. So is there, now the students are taking this course are also the kind of students you're familiar with. They're not necessarily scientists. And so how can you say anything about how to help them think about the question, are we alone? Yeah. I, well, I, I mean, for myself, trying to think it through again as a non-scientist, I did find it very helpful to work my way through the Drake equation. Um, and, you know, modern commentaries on it or updates on, on the Drake equation. Um, but, I, but I also think that, that even understanding the significance of the question is, is hard if you don't have somewhere in your mind some sense of a universal story, which takes me back to big history. I think just even in a, a, a fairly naive version of the story can provide a, a framework within which you can ask good questions. And that's my complaint about modern education, is that it doesn't provide the framework for even asking good questions, like, are we alone? Or, or at least asking them in a sophisticated way. If, if, you, if you have in the back of your mind some sense that there is a coherent story that links cosmology and physio physics and planetary science and so on, then you're going to be open to exploring a question that has you zooming back and forth between planetary science and chemistry and physics and biology and neuroscience. Um, but if, you, if you're locked into a sort of specialized, siloized education, you're going to find it hard to appreciate the question and even much harder to answer it. So, so, so that's why I think there's a sort of a, a understanding something like what I teach as big history is, is crucial to even asking questions like this. Well, how about the idea, I mean, as, as, a, as a physical scientist, I, physical scientists in general are really a, almost allergic to giving humans a role in, uh, I guess, the cosmic evolution. For example, that's one of the things that Eric Chason talks about. He says, big history, the problem with big history, it, puts, it tells this story and necessarily it puts the human being or the student uh, front and center, so it's kind of like, well, we have a subjective requirement that we be the heroes of the story, otherwise we're not going to be interested in it, but that sounds like just subjectivity rather than objectivity. Yeah, look, that, that's an argument to be just sorted out rigorously. I mean, is this just subjective? So there is, and I, you know, I push back to Eric on this. Um, you, you may suppose that I spend so much time talking about humans out of some sort of hubris. Um, but let's look carefully at a claim. The claim is quite simple. It is that this species is weird on scales of four billion years. Now, I think you can run a good argument along those lines. And if you can, um, and I suspect Eric would agree with the argument, I don't think he'd have any problem with it, then I've justified my claim that if I'm going to look at the history of this planet, I'm probably going to have to look at the formation of the planet, I'm going to have to look at the formation of life, the appearance of life, try to make some sort of sense of that, 
And if, you know, time is short and I can't look at, you know, all the stages of the evolution of life and yeah. I'm talking to human beings, then I've got two justifications for focusing on humans. One, that I'm talking to humans, but the second, that objectively speaking, our appearance is an event of planetary significance. So, so I think this is an argument that's to be sorted out yeah. rationally and, and empirically and for what it's worth, I'm prepared to argue <laughs> that there are objective reasons for treating the appearance of our species as a threshold in planetary, planetary history. I mean, either way, it's very interesting because as a teacher, I, I always alert my students to the possibility that, that we're just, this is species arrogance speaking, and just raise this question. I think it's an incredibly interesting question because it brings them back to a question that ought to be at the core of the humanities I think even a lot of the sciences, mm -hmm. which is this question, what the hell makes us different? Who are we? Uh, who are we? Well, yeah. when somebody says, what makes me different? So, what I teach my students, I say, yes, you're right. Humans are unique, just like every other species. Well, then I, I don't agree with that because, they're, <laughs> because my, the point about my argument is they're unique. They are unique, just like every other species. Um, but they are also unique in in, in another, another way species. that makes them unlike all other species. Uh, the, so, and that is collective learning is how you would well, it's a, it's some mechanism. I, th I think collective learning is a helpful way of describing it that gives this species every. I mean, every living organism has what you could call ecological power. It, it controls some of the energy flows and resource flows in its environment. Mm -hmm. um, but there are limits to, the, to its control. Here we have a species where if there are limits, we've not seen them yet. And we know that this species over time has learned how to control environments on planetary scales, on the same scales as volcanoes or the climate system. Now, that is weird. Uh, and, and you can say, this is something that, 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 that we do that no other species does, no other species we know of. Well, when you say the word control, I guess it almost assumes volition or agency and free will, and that's a big controversy. It doesn't necessarily assume it. No, it not doesn't. at all, not at all. Um, okay, so let, let's, we, yeah, one doesn't need to be precise about this. The collectively, we're managing energy flows on planetary scales. But this is where the word agency needs to be teased out very carefully. And I think very often it doesn't get used carefully enough because there's individual agency and there's collective agency and they are utterly different things. Um, Marx knew this. He talks about the fetishism of commodities and money. If I see a dollar bill, um, it's very hard to resist the idea that it contains value um, and I will use it as an individual and it will coerce me in, in a sense. Um, collectively, we humans created this, but that doesn't mean as individuals we did. So, so we can say that collectively we've created something. It doesn't mean we're in charge of the thing. So this is the thing that scares the hell out of me. It's as if collectively we've built this colossal machine that, that dominates energy flows throughout an entire planet, I don't think we really know how to manage the thing. I mean, we're working like crazy to try to hide. I have this, this nightmare of waking up at the controls of a 747 and someone whispers in my ear, Captain, are you ready to land at LA airport? And I look at the dials and I think, I don't know what these are. What, am I supposed to press a button or pull a lever or something? Mm -hmm. and, and I sometimes think that's sort of the situation where humans are in. So, so the word agency often gets used as a sort of mantra in historical writing, but you really do need to tease out those two types of agency. Collectively, agency, each individual may not have much control over it, but nevertheless, as a species, we did it. Um, well, how about the idea that uh, you know plants created uh, oxygen and then that got too much oxygen, so some, so the free energy gradient available had to create something that would take the oxygen and eat the plants and then turn it back into CO2. So that would be like a an environmental determinism rather than the species itself being in control, but rather hey the niche is there, then something had to do it. It's sometimes uh, well, there's a, for example when there's a pressure gradient, temperature gradient, humidity gradient, then <clears throat> you form a hurricane. 
So then what does the hurricane do? It undoes the gradient, which gave it birth. Yeah. And so if you interpret the origin of life that way and species that way, which you can do, then that takes away all kinds of, that takes away any type of agency from even collective agency or individual agency. So how would you answer this ecological approach, which just says there is no such thing as agency, no control, no stewardship. You're just there because the environment set up some gradients that you take advantage of. But, but or, so, okay, so, so, so that need to be taken advantage of. But, but, but I think determinism, like agency, it's, it, it, it gets flung around a bit, certainly in, you know, it, 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 by historians, it gets flung around a bit too, too carelessly. Um, did, I, I don't know of any determinism that, that's 100%. Um, so what we're really talking about, I think it'd be better to dump the word determinism and talk about very powerful drivers. Now, with this story of increasing complexity, if, if it's even vaguely right, it raises this wonderful question, which I think you've thought a lot about. Are there drivers of increasing complexity? Now, maybe the second law, at some fundamental level, the, the, the second law is the most general driver of increasing complexity uh, through some sort of twisted, demonic work. Well, no, no, I, I, I would say that the, start, the universe starts out at low gravitational entropy, and then the, that increases as things collapse, right. and then that sets up gradients, and then things take advantage of those gradients. Then you have these, what you call complex systems, yes. I would call necess the, the structures that are macroscopic, like convection cells or fires or, uh, or yeah. life, that then are produced by the gradients to eliminate the gradients, and that, and that means the purpose of any of these things is to increase the entropy and conform to the second law. But how far would you go with that argument in denying, in denying all agency to the parts of the universe? Every, as far as you would go as far as you like. So, so, so there's no agency right. anywhere at all. That's right. I, I, I guess, I guess my, I mean, my reaction to that is is that that may be helpful at a universal scale. It's not necessarily a terribly helpful answer to the local scale because, because even if there is this generalized agency, I don't think anyone would go as far as to say that um, the second law of entropy gave us Putin. So, you know, the, 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 there are stochastic processes here and, and to, um, there, are, there are processes at smaller scales that it's just not helpful really to talk at that level. It may be ultimately true that that's what drives increasing complexity, but, but we want to know why complexity increased in this particular environment well, or you, this you, particular but area. But you just threw an argument back at me that I had thrown at you, and that is, <laughs> you said, Putin, you can't explain Putin. Yeah, well, exactly, you could, exactly. Well, you could, if you say, well, what is Putin? Putin's a human being running a country, a country is exploiting its natural resources and creating all kinds of entropy and doing what all countries are supposed to do. And that, that is an entropy producing, anytime you have a refrigerator, anytime you have something far yeah. from equilibrium, anytime you have any organizational structure, anytime you have these complex things, you have to maintain them, and that maintenance increases the entropy of the universe sure. over and above what would be the case and therefore these are entropy producing structures and so that's but that's can't you so as humans isn't the challenge for us is to do this with subtlety rather than rather crudely isn't it i mean i i think um so so it seems to me now I, again, I, I'm very tentative in saying, talk, saying this to a cosmologist, but, but it seems to me that you could say that star formation is a pretty crude mechanism driven by gravitational gradients. Huge amounts of energy are turned into heat energy. When, if you look inside a cell, um, what you see is these incredibly delicate mechanisms that move energy electron by electron or proton by proton through the cell walls. Mm -hmm. If they used energy in a sort of more violent way, the cells couldn't possibly exist. So this is delicate use of energy. Mm -hmm. And that is surely what today in the Anthropocene we're looking for. And Putin is not managing well, well, sure energy in a delicate way. Oh. Um, so, so I think, you know, there, there, there are, entropy works in, in, in different ways in different contexts. And, and for us humans, those differences really matter. But, but you're not a creationist who would argue, you used the word kickback earlier about it. 
about half an hour ago, you said, we kick back against the second law. And I said, well, that's an interesting term. You're not <laughs> violating the second law, you're kicking back against it. For me, that means there's an organizational structure, there's an organization, yeah. which whose organization necessarily increases the entropy faster than it would be the case. Yeah. Convection yeah. cells versus diffusion, for example. So I wouldn't call it kicking back. I mean, no, no, Dyson no. would call it a hang up, for example, is a hang up associated with it. But I'm not sure that's no, the right I'll word. take back that metaphor. It's, okay. it's, it's okay. not a very precise metaphor. But, so, but there are a lot of creationists who think, hey, the second law has to be wrong because, look, life yeah. violates it. You don't believe that. Absolutely not. Okay. No, 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 no. I, I, you know, I, I seriously do buy the argument that I think I've read in, in your writings that, that, that uh, you know, if, if there's a God, it's the second law, you know, that, that, that this may be the ultimate driver. But, but, but still, I, I, what, what, it remains significant that things happen that at on first acquaintance, look like pushback. Ultimately, if you understand them more deeply, you may understand they're not pushback at all. They're actually the whole machine working more efficiently than usual, which I, I think is the payoff to your argument. Yes. But, but it, nevertheless, I think, certainly for what, what I'm doing, that stage where something happens that looks like pushback at end is very interesting. Um, well, sure. Hurricanes are interesting. It, Life it, is it interesting. Generates, it generates these complex entities which we're interested right. in. Well, that's what Prigozhin has talked about, far from equilibrium dissipative yes. systems. Yes. And so, but you don't, do you want to go with this argument and put humans in the category of far from equilibrium dissipative systems? Or do you want to add some volition and agency and stewardship and then say we're in control, but a hurricane would not do that? We, will, we don't accuse hurricanes of being in control. On the other hand, they are doing something. Yes. They're highly organized. Organized. They're very dissipative, just like we are, but we're adding something new here. Push to the limits. I, I, I probably turn into a determinist at this point because there are, there are Susan Blackmore has written about. Who's that? Susan Blackmore uh -huh. has written about. Dan, Dan Dennett has written about experiments in which um, you, 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 you get someone to do something very simple, like lift a finger but you're also tracking what's happening in their brain. And the payoff to a lot of these experiments is that the decision to lift the finger happened before the person was aware of making the decision. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, what that suggests is that, that there, is, there is something illusory about volition. Um, volition may depend on the fact that quantum physics gives a bit of wriggle room for all you know, so all Roger Penrose would say that. <laughs> all causal mechanisms. Mm -hmm. But um, even that doesn't necessarily explain volition in the sort of sense of free will. And I've got an increasing suspicion, this goes back to this argument about information, that it may be helpful to distinguish between universal and local information, that there are complex entities that depend on being able to read local information. They exist in very specific environments. And then again, that justifies the use of the idea of Goldilocks conditions in some context. If, if these entities are, have the capacity to read local information, some of that information is going to be so hard to detect from outside that what you're going to have is something like the butterfly effect. In other words, if you, you try to explain why does the E. coli move in this direction rather than that, it's probably an impossible question. Um, because it may be responding to processes so minuscule that we have no chance of ever tracking them. Now, if that's true, one way of interpreting this, uh, this illusion of agency, which is very powerful whenever you get living things, it's just hard to avoid the sense of purpose and agency. Um, it, it, it may be that that is simply a product of of the fact that they're responding to things that we as outside observers are never going to be able to see, and that may even apply to us, that we ourselves, when we make what seem like free decisions, are responding to things that we can't see. Um, so, right. yeah, I, I, I'm not sure I like this line of argument, <laughs> okay. but, but I find it quite compelling. Okay. And it, well, it suggests that the, the whole idea of age, but there's a level at which the idea of agency is helpful. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so as long as you stay clear, As long as I feel good about it. <laughs> how about, do you have any big history jokes for our uh, listeners, for our students? Oh. You're teaching big history for a long time. There must be some standard jokes that you use that's in your a, lectures. That's a fabulous question. I, I, uh, 
sorry, none, none are <laughs> popping into my brain at the moment. I, I was always terrible. I always wished I could remember jokes. I, ne I, I never could. So I don't even try to tell jokes in lectures <laughs> because I know I'll, I'll, I'll mess up the punchline. So the are we alone? Uh, how did we get here and are we alone? Any last words? Okay, okay. Um, if we're alone, I, so either answer to that question is weird. It's no, no good thinking that one answer is weirder than the other. The idea of us being alone, I think, is as weird as the idea of us not being alone. Um, I, I've defined being alone as there being no other creatures capable of collective learning in a universe with, what, well, hundreds of billions of galaxies, each with hundreds of billions of stars, each with, you know, each with, with orbiting planets. Um, so I, I, I think it is important to remember that, that, that there's, there's absolutely no easy answer to this question. It, it's like whether the universe is infinite or, or, or not. Either, either answer may be, may be wrong. Well, we're making progress on that. We're making progress. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> the, def the good default is infinite. Yeah, actually, actually I'm, I'm, I'm talking more about origin stories because when you, if you talk about origin stories, you look at origin stories, indigenous origin stories, the Christian stories, the scientific story. Um, how you begin the story is a, is a, is a real nightmare. Um, and, and many of them, if you look carefully at them, you find that they have faced the dilemma of an infinite regress or a starting point. And e each starting point is as bizarre as the other one. Um, and I suspect that's true for... Yeah. We're trying to make that less true of science, though. <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much.